Welcome, everyone. I'm Danny Warshe. I'm the executive director of the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. Really happy that you're all with us this afternoon. Uh, those of you who are regulars know that I always ask the same question at the beginning of all of our events, but it's to welcome those of you who are not regulars. And that is, raise your hand uh, if this is your first Nelson Center event. I love seeing that. So thank you to the newcomers for being with us today, maybe even a few others sneaking in. Uh, but we're really um, active in reaching out to the broader Brown community. And uh, raise your hand if you're from even beyond Brown, from beyond into the community at large, beyond Brown. Uh, sometimes we have people who are not even affiliated with Brown, and I want to welcome any of those uh, who um, are you, because we are... Uh, doing everything related to entrepreneurship that seems to fit and resonate with all corners of the Brown campus and all corners even beyond Brown into Rhode Island. And many of our events are now live streamed. So we have people watching from all over the world and we have a very active YouTube channel. And so uh, even today's uh, event will be archived there. Uh, I think those of you who know us a little bit know that our focus on entrepreneurship is based on a definition which is a structured process for problem solving. And I was describing that a little bit to David a couple of minutes ago. And we're going to see that resonate, I think, throughout David's career and especially in what he's doing now with his new company, Lyra. Uh, we express that throughout three different buckets. We teach courses. We support academic research. That's the curricular side. I see some of my students, current and former, here today, which is nice to welcome you. And then the second is co-curricular, uh, and this is a good representation of our co-curricular activities. Speakers, events, workshops, just like this, and many more. And uh, then the third is we like to say we not only motivate you to learn about entrepreneurship, we will empower you to do it. And I see many of you who are involved with that component, that bucket of the Nelson Center as well, that will comprise increasing amounts of grant funding. We run a summer accelerator that I know some of you have participated in or will be participating in called B-Lab. Uh, we run a Brown Venture Prize competition which awards $50,000 and which did so uh, a couple weeks ago. And we have a program that awards $50,000 in grant money if you commit to staying here in Rhode Island to run your startup. And we will formally be awarding those and announcing those um, on the 25th uh, at an event that you are all welcome to attend. It's Sushi and Networking in collaboration with the Slater Center, the Slater Fund, which is a uh, seed fund uh, that is collaborating with us. There's information about that. There's information about everything I just described, including a place where you can sign up for our periodic email updates where you can learn about all these events. And to do that, you can go to entrepreneurship.brown.edu. So that's a little bit about putting this event into context. I want to welcome David here today back to campus. I was saying that at uh, 12.50, it'll be nostalgic because the bell will ring. And um, that's nostalgic even for me, who uh, has been involved in um, Brown for so long. And, uh, I will also mention that if you have to leave, I'm not encouraging you to leave, but at 12.50 in time for a one o'clock class, we won't be offended. We'll probably pause for a minute and then reconvene a couple minutes later, maybe even in a little bit more intimate setting. Uh, and maybe I'll start there uh, in welcome you, welcoming you back. I know we're going to talk about a wide range of things, and I'm going to encourage people uh, who are here to listen to you, not only to listen, but to actively participate and ask some questions. And uh, you know my teaching style is to cold call if necessary. I don't think I'll have to resort to that. But um, I, I thought I might start by having you think back to your time at Brown as a student. You studied economics and international relations and I'm sure a host of lots of other things. What do you remember from those days? Uh, whether or not it has anything to do initially with what you're doing now, but what stands out in your mind about your Brown experience? Sure, um, I, I think I'm gonna stand up if that's okay, because I can't see the faces if I don't, and it's more fun to see. Hopefully people who are actually listening will, will find out. Um, so first of all, thank you, and thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure to come back to campus where I had such a wonderful four years, and uh, it makes me feel happy to be here. Um, 
All right, so uh, your question, what I remember from Brown, I'll make, uh, I'll start with a joke because you were saying the 1250 bell. I did spend the first, I think, two years only taking classes that started at one. I thought that was a, <laughs> like, if you could, why wouldn't you? You know, then you could sleep late. But then I realized that I was missing a lot of important things, so I gave that up my last two years. Um, and uh, I also remember how nice it is when the sun comes out, so I hope you're all enjoying that sort of feeling that spring has arrived and it feels very happy. Uh, so I think the most important thing I remember from Brown, which has had great resonance for me, I think, uh, throughout what's my, my life uh, since Brown, is Brown was the place where I really woke up to the idea that learning was interesting for the sake of learning. Um, I think in my life through high school, I did homework because I was told to and because I felt like I was supposed to, and I read because people made me, um, but I did not spend time actively pursuing um, knowledge for the sake of it because I found it fun and interesting and stimulating. And why I feel so fortunate uh, for the experience I had for Brown is Brown was the place where I started finding myself at, myself at the library or wherever um, learning and studying and talking because I was really stimulated and I was curious and I wanted to know and learn and understand things that I didn't uh, grasp. And that's such a wonderful way to approach life, whatever direction you head in, is to be really hungry for knowledge and, and curious about things. And I think that's made all the different things I've done since Brown, and it's been a long time, I graduated about 30 years ago, um, so fun and interesting because I'm always trying to find problems that uh, I want to learn more about and want to be involved in. And that's, I think, the best thing that I took from Brown. I would say the second thing that uh, has served me well um, that I'm sure we'll come back to later, the Brown I experienced, and I hope you're all finding the same thing, though I think the world has probably changed and, may and maybe not for the better, the Brown I experienced was very a place of great debate. You know, people would sit at dinner or wherever and really talk about differences of opinions on whatever subject, be it silly things like art or not, I don't mean art is silly, but like TV shows. Um, but also politics. We spent a lot of time just debating. I, I had six roommates I spent basically all four years with. We had varying perspectives along the political spectrum and really enjoyed sort of that discourse. How do you have a quality conversation about different ideas that's not about attacking the individuals, that's not about uh, uh, creating enemies? And that's a really important part of work. I've discovered, and again, I'll talk about this more later depending upon what the questions are. Um, so, uh, I think half of work is problem solving and half of work is getting along with the people that you work with. And having the skills to be able to disagree in a way that isn't uh, disruptive or uh, destructive um, to, the, uh, to the organization is a really important thing. And I think I very much learned that or began to learn that at Brown. I'll tell you what, I'll stand as well. And we can just stand. Well, let's stand. Uh, and did you take Barbara Tenenbaum's course on uh, public speaking? I well, did not. Okay, I did. And uh, she always says, take up space. So we'll take <laughs> up space. Uh, we can do that standing. And I'm used to standing as a professor anyway. Uh, I, I love your emphasis on learning for its own sake. Uh, this is uh, a rare time in life when you're told to do that. And so don't miss the opportunity. Uh, because it may not be, there may not be other times when you're told as explicitly to do that. I, I hope you find time, nevertheless, since then, to immerse yourself in something that is uh, still learning for its own sake. I don't want to necessarily put you on the spot unless you want to respond to that, but I think that makes us interesting people throughout our lives, not narrowly limited just to those four years. But it sounds like you really took advantage of at least those four years when we were told that's your responsibility in life to, for those four years, immerse yourself in all sorts of t topics. And it sounds like you did that nicely both in the classroom and out of the classroom, at the ratty uh, or wherever you happen to be, in learning from other people and debating each other on topics of interest. Is, did I capture that? Yeah, and I'm a big believer in the idea that uh, learning about different kinds of things creates patterns that are hard to predict that will benefit you. So um, you may know something that you're really interested in. You may not yet, but if you do, I hope that you also take time here to, to at least take some classes in things that may not be obviously connected. Uh, we were speaking about this a second earlier. Um, I took one philosophy class in my four years here, and I don't know why. Like, I can't recreate what got me to do that. But I'm really glad I did. It like just had it, it approached problems in a way that was slightly co different and complementary to some of the other things that I was doing, and I think was just helpful for how I think. And so you were asking about now. It gets harder 
when you are all in on a job and you're trying to build a company, I spend most of my time doing that and hopefully enough time raising family as well. Um, but I try and play music a little bit. It's just a totally different way of using your brain that I think sort of clears my head. And I try to find time to read history and other things. And I really believe I can't prove it. I've never done any research. But that something about creating a different conversation in your head uh, opens your eyes to different possibilities on the main problems that you're trying to solve in your life or work or wherever else. So um, being able to sort of uh, disconnect for a sec and still think, I think just freshens you for the problem that you come back to. Yeah, I was saying before that uh, our perspective on entrepreneurship at Brown, I think, is different from what you would hear if you were in other really good places. But our emphasis is on entrepreneurship as a liberal art as a skill set that you can develop and not know exactly how you're going to apply it at any given point throughout the rest of your life. But I know from hearing back from many of my students throughout the last 13 years that that approach seems to resonate unexpectedly at different times. So maybe that philosophy course uh, rears its head at right. times when you hadn't necessarily anticipated that. And uh, I think that's a way we like to espouse entrepreneurship here, that it's not necessarily for any particular outcome, uh, but it's as, uh, as a skill set that on its own has real value. And then for the rest of your life, it, it might resonate, show its force in ways that you can't necessarily predict. Having said that, and I almost hesitate to ask the follow-up question because I don't want to contradict what I just said, that it's useful on its own, but I'm curious whether you have seen connections between what you studied here and then when, what you embarked on in your professional career. If the answer is no, that's OK. Because like you know, art or philosophy, for its own sake, it was worthwhile. But often when I ask people that, in retrospect, they may not have predicted it, you do see how dots connected. And I'm curious what might some of those have been? Yeah, I think that anything that you learn will help you in, in other contexts. And so I guess the example I could think of is my senior year at Brown, I wrote a thesis in international relations. So and I, I, I wrote a, a terrible paper. It was very long. I read it recently, and it's really not very well written, but, but I enjoyed working on it, about French foreign relations with the United States, which is not something that I have pursued since then. But the process of writing that, I think, was really important to me on several levels. Um, one is the rigor and structure about researching a problem and really understanding um, what information is out there and how do you organize it and synthesize it, including all of the pieces of it that contradict. Because that was the fun part about that paper, was reading two different sources that would say opposite things about the same issue and trying to figure out, what do I do with that? And you see that all the time in life. You know, Problems aren't black and white, and they're not simple. You've got to really embrace the complexity. Um, and then the second thing that I really uh, uh, am glad I did this for is I think writing is just a really important skill. Um, and whatever direction your career takes you, I don't mean to say you have to do this, but being a good writer will just help you to be effective in influencing other people. It's very hard to make an impact on the world if you can't influence other people. Um, so if you aspire to make an impact and to do something that, that has resonance, you have to be able to influence. You can do it with the spoken word. That's a great thing, but the written word can you know, just be propagated in different sorts of ways. And to write persuasively, and to write concisely, and to write clearly, such a valuable skill to bring to whatever set of problems you had. So I wouldn't have known when I was working on that 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 was something that would be so important. But editing that, that paper over and over and over and over again, um, I learned a lot about writing that I still find myself now, use email a lot, like in emails, editing the important ones, editing them over and over and try, to try and make the points clear and concise so that I can communicate what I'm trying to communicate effectively. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And uh, it's nice to see that Brown has caught up to your insight about that. Most people think Brown, it's, uh, it's a place with no requirements. But as all of you know, Brown has requirements. You have to fulfill a concentration. You have to pass a certain number of courses. And you have to demonstrate writing proficiency. The good news about that is it's not always in the classic way of taking a written composition course, although there are many of those. Uh, for example, my course is a writ course. It's an entrepreneurship course. You wouldn't think that that's a way to demonstrate writing proficiency, but any of my 1010 students know that you really do have to perfect that skill. And I always use that as an analog for the way we describe what I just did about entrepreneurship as a liberal art, that you developed a writing competency, but I don't think you would describe yourself as a professional writer. Uh, in the same way, developing a competency in the skill set we call entrepreneurship 
doesn't mean that you are necessarily going to project yourself through your career as having um, a focus on the classic entrepreneurial startup. But nevertheless, you will use writing, as you just attested, in virtually anything you do. And we always say now that you'll use the entrepreneurial process in also anything you do. And that's a good way to, to link those two through the common element of liberal arts. Uh, I want to leap forward to okay. what you're doing now, All right. because I, I, I don't want to dismiss any of what came before, because I know people know about uh, what you did before, but a little bit about Lyra and uh, where that came from. And, and maybe if it's OK, I'll frame the question even a little bit through the lens of that entrepreneurial process uh, that I just described. So the first part of that process, all my students know, is uh, if it's about solving a problem, then what is that problem? Find and validate an unmet need. And if you go through the Lear website, you'll see a whole bunch of stakeholders that you um, attest to serve. And that must imply that there's lots of different problems that you're looking to solve. But I'm curious, what was the initial spark for this that interested you? What was the problem that you identified? And it may not have persisted. It may not still be the problem you're serving. But what was the initial spark that got you interested in this particular field? Because it, it may tangentially relate to some of what you had done previously, but it doesn't seem obvious on its face. So I don't even know if that's a fair way to ask the question, but how would you think about it that way? Sure. Uh, you can ask the question any way you okay. want. I'll do my best to answer it. Um, well, let me start by just saying a little bit about what Lyra is, because then maybe that the, sure. the rest of it will flow in. So uh, Lyra is a company that um, I co-founded four years ago that tries to um, help people find quickly really high quality mental health care. So if you're struggling with issues of anxiety or depression or substance abuse or related things, rather than feeling like you're kind of on your own to figure out how you might get the right help for what your needs are, Lyra tries to make that really simple and really easy and get you as close to immediately as we can connected to the right care for your needs so you can start uh, getting better. Um, so that that's what we do. Um, so the origin for me, I think, very much aligns with what you were describing as the entrepreneurial process. I found myself really interested and curious about this part of the healthcare system and this problem based on, to some degree, some personal experience and some um, uh, conversations with other people about how poorly this part of the healthcare system worked. And as I started to explore and uh, learn more about it, it felt to me like just one of those things that was so misaligned and I couldn't understand why. You know, you just stumble into these problems that feel like this shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be so broken. And so the dynamics of the problem I found really interesting were, first of all, just the scope of it. So uh, mental health problems affect about 20% of Americans in any given year. So it's just, there's a lot of, there's tens of millions of people you could try to help. That's exciting to me versus working on something smaller. Um, second of all, the problems finding uh, great care and getting it quickly are widely understood and known. So there's a bunch of problems related just to accessing a professional who might be a good match for your needs. The healthcare networks that most people have tend to struggle to find providers who have availability. Uh, you can often find out you can call, call 10 people and have none of them call you back and say, yes, I can see you in any reasonable time frame. And then the other part that was really interesting to me, I think without this, I probably wouldn't have uh, responded the way I did. The quality of care is really quite variable in mental health. Um, there isn't some sort of overriding one way of approaching this problem set. It's still, you can, you can wander through the system for years and get very different approaches to trying to treat the same symptoms. I found that really interesting. Um, in the world that I'd grown up in, and we can talk about this a little bit more early, uh, at, a, at a subsequent point if you want, I worked in drug development for a long time where there's a very structured process in proving that you help people. The FDA exists as this gatekeeper, and if you can't get something through the FDA, if you cannot convince them that the drug that you're working on is safe and effective, you cannot sell it to anybody. So there's this sort of rigor to, you know that if your doctor prescribes a drug for you, I can't promise it'll work for you, but it has been studied, or should have been studied in a population that resembles you, and at least on a population basis, it's this added value was effective and the trade-offs for safety were felt to be positive. And in mental health, there just wasn't that sort of organizing principle that, that I was able to find. So it was really just very, it felt very difficult, very confusing, very hard to navigate. And I felt like if you created an organization that could help that person who's struggling 
to understand where immediately accessible high quality care is, that we could address the fact of make it easier for people who are struggling to sort of raise their hand and try and get care, because a lot of people don't do anything and don't get treated. Um, we could help them to get care more quickly, and we could help bias their care towards high quality care for what their unique needs are. So the problems felt really interesting. Um, and uh, I was very passionate about them. I found as I read about them, I wanted to read more. I would use, I always use that as a test that has worked really well for me, is if I bring home at night a bunch of materials about a problem, and if I leave it next to the bed and read something else, that's a good sign that I'm not actually that passionate about that problem. It doesn't mean it's not an important problem. It doesn't mean that someone else in this room might not really work, want to work on that problem, but it's not speaking to me in some fashion. As I was doing research and learning more about the challenges and the opportunities in mental health, I wanted, I was like, where's the next book? Where's the next article? I really wanted to dive deeper. That's a really good sign for me that it's a problem that's going to sustain me and help me t on the hard days and on the difficult challenges. You, you raised a specific point from reading our website that we have a bunch of different stakeholders. I would say that's a symptom of trying to do something useful in the space as opposed to a design on purpose principle. So as we got into the journey, of building the company, we discovered uh, things I didn't know going in about how complicated elements of the healthcare system are, how many people are involved, how we have to work with multiple stakeholders in, to, in order to try and drive change at all. But that's all been sort of the how part, not the what part. The what part that we started with was uh, the, the fundamental problem of people who are suffering and struggling to find good care and trying to make it easier for them to do so. I love how you label the different questions, again, the. The uh, students of mine in the, who are here today will identify the distinction between value proposition, a solution for the problem, and sustainability model, which is the how, how you're going to structure that impact and how you're going to do it to have scale. Uh, I, I, I want to mention that we're soon going to transition to some questions. I don't want to wait until the very end, and if there's not questions immediately, we'll continue riffing. But uh, keep in mind some questions. I just figured let's lay some groundwork. You've done so many interesting things throughout your life thus far that we might as well um, let you talk a little bit about them. Uh, I'm curious about, you mentioned Genentech and the, the time you spent there. I think you said 15 years. Uh, how might you reflect back on that? And, and part of the reason I'm asking this is we have lots of students here who are maybe starting to think about or really obsessed about, let's face it, life after Brown. And uh, I, I don't know if that was your mindset when you were a senior. I don't know if you imagined a linear path. I don't know if looking backwards you see any evidence of linear. Um, do you and does it matter? And what would be your recommendation to students who are here today who are thinking about their own career path after Brown? Well, let, let me start by asking all of you a question. I'm curious if, if you are willing to show hands. I promise I won't call on you. You can do that. Um, <laughs> but how many of you feel like in 10 years you have reasonable confidence what generally you'll be doing with your career? So, a, a reasonable number. Call it 25%, something like that. So, um, so when I graduated from Brown, I actually thought uh, I had clarity on what I was going to be doing. I was going to become a, his a history professor. So I told you about my experience writing a thesis. I really enjoyed that. I was fired up by it. And I thought I'd love to do more of that, and that that was speaking to me at that time. Um, and uh, I ended up applying to schools and, um, and all sorts of things. I, I needed to get it. I hadn't taken all the tests and done the applications when I was at Brown, so I needed to, to do something for that year in between. I, I didn't really want to work, to be honest, but I didn't want to live with my mom either. So I got a job, um, really just so that I could pay rent somewhere and live with some some brown friends, of course. Um, and I ended up getting a job on Wall Street, not because that was what was like what I was necessarily targeting, but because there was a brown alum who was willing to hire me and pay me, and that was my criteria at that point. Um, and uh, so, that, and I told him, like, I will work for you for a year, and then I'm going to go back and get my PhD and sort of roll forward. Um, and, uh, and I ended up actually matriculating. Like, on a Friday, I sent in a check, and I told the school I was coming back. And I had one of those very funny weekends that you might have at some point in your life where I just was miserable all weekend. Like, I was. I felt physically and emotionally sick, and I just convinced myself that 
I didn't really want to go back. And that this was my body telling me I was really enjoying my work and that when I visited the schools, I just wasn't sure that it was really the path that was the right one for me. So I called back on, I canceled the check and I called back on Monday and I told the guy, sorry, I'm not coming after all. And then I went to my, I quit my job on Friday. But luckily over the weekend, he had not replaced me. So I went in on Monday and I said, just <laughs> that, forget that conversation never happened. Um, and and, uh, and I, I stayed for a couple more years. Um, so, and one of the reasons I tell the story is because I do think that there's a, my my personal journey has been filled with serendipity. I couldn't have, any of the moves I've made, and I'll tell you a little about them because maybe it'll help frame up questions, I wouldn't have known was coming until it came, until it was like put in front of me. I didn't know I was going to do that next. Um, and I've never really had a master plan. That does not mean you shouldn't. I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with planning. It's just the way I kind of am. Same way when I took exams at Brown, I started studying the day before. Like I just, I, I, I don't get organized like that. Um, but that's worked for me, and, and I've had a really fun and interesting career that, I, that I've enjoyed. Um, so at any rate, uh, my first job after um, deciding I wasn't going to go back and get a PhD in history, I was a research analyst on, on, uh, at an investment bank on Wall Street. Um, I didn't really like that job very much. I'm happy to talk about it if people have questions. I didn't, it just didn't stimulate me as much as I thought something else might. Um, but I, I did learn, and I'm, I'm glad that I did it from, from that standpoint. And I had the good fortune that one day one of the companies that uh, we covered, a, a biotech company called Genentech in, in the Bay Area, in San Francisco area, called me, and, and I, I had known the company company because we had a relationship with them from the job I had, and they offered me a job. Um, and, um, and I was really excited to try working at a company that had really inspired me based on the interactions I'd had. Again, I'm happy to talk about Genetech, but I won't for the moment. Um, I did a bunch of different things there, um, all of which were random. So not, no job that I had four different jobs in 15 years in different groups. I worked in business development and product development and, and manufacturing and finance. None of them were planned. It was, every one of them was one day someone said, you know, we could use you over here. And I said, OK, if that's where you want me, I'll go there now. And I got to learn a bunch of different things. I'm not really very deep at anything um, because I've bounced around a lot, but I've had a lot of breath in my career, which has been fun and stimulating. And again, I don't advocate for. Some people really want to go deep in one thing, but it's worked for me to not do that so far. Um, so I stayed there for a really long time. I loved it. I would have probably expected to, sp to spend my entire career there. Um, but one day, the company got bought. I shouldn't say one day. Like It was a year battle. It was a hostile situation that I was in the middle of. So it was really fun and interesting, um, <laughs> but did not end the way I was imagining. Um, so we spent a year trying to prevent this acquisition from happening. And uh, ultimately, it did happen. Um, and, and that's, of course, fine. But it did mean that I was not going to be there for the rest of my I was the first person fired after the deal closed. So, um, and, uh, so so I needed a new job, and literally just total coincidence uh, the, that Facebook had decided to let go its, its chief financial officer like the same day that the Genentech acquisition closed. So it was like they were both in the news at the same time. And Facebook called me, and I really, uh, again, you can ask me questions if you find this interesting, but I, I didn't take it seriously because I didn't really know what Facebook was. But one thing led to another, and I got excited about that, and I went and worked there for about five years, which was a really interesting experience. I'm, I'm very glad I had. Um, and then got what one might describe as the entrepreneurial bug, except it wouldn't apply in your criteria, because uh, under your criteria, I was an entrepreneur from the day I graduated. I was trying to solve problems. I was trying to be thoughtful. Um, so and I like your criteria more than thinking of entrepreneurship as just the starting of a company. But at any rate, um, having worked uh, in various environments, I got excited about a problem and an opportunity to build a company. And I started Lyra from there. And all of those, you know, there's, there's like more I can tell about any of those things. I just want to give you enough context that if any of that interests you, you can sort of ask me to go deeper, and I'd be happy to. I think what's exciting, and maybe even some of you have this pattern recognition, but I certainly do. By, the pleasure of being in this seat, or non-seat, um, whenever we have guests like you come to campus is, your story sounds very brown. It sounds very, uh, you know, I'm not demeaning or diminishing its uh, unique importance for you. Just if, if you heard that story and you're on Brown's campus, I think you'd say, well, of course. You didn't exactly know what you were gonna do. You meandered some, you followed your instincts. The other two things of, of um, recognition I have from what you've described. You said you have a way of deciding whether something's going to be uh, something you really want to sink your teeth into by whether you remain interested enough to keep reading about it. And that's a really good signal, it sounds, for you. Not necessarily everybody's signal, but you're pretty well attuned to a signal that works well for you. And the other was paying attention to that discomfort you had over that fateful weekend when you decided to cancel the check and 
uh, not get a PhD in history. And that may have been not that you don't like history, but the recognition that you don't want to go really deep into something. If you're going to get a PhD in history, you're yeah. going to, you would have spent, I don't know, six years researching something better than anybody in the world and writing something uh, that would have had a lot of depth to it and not nearly the breadth. And I think breadth is something that, again, is uh, often an outcome of a liberal arts curriculum where you know lots of things, you're not an expert per se in any of them, and then you find how you're going to apply them throughout your life. And, and uh, so again, uh, to me, it's part of, you're part of the brown club in that way, and not uniquely brown, but um, I don't think anybody would hear your story and say, well, that's weird. Uh, that, that seems typical, if anything. Does that sound right to you in terms of your own contact, maybe with your own brown friends and others you've stayed in touch with? It does. I feel very brown. You know, I felt very comfortable here, and like it was a, a place that welcomed me for who I was, and, and, um, and I felt supported in any of the random things that I did or, or that happened to me. Um, I do think, the only thing I'd say, though, is that uh, I definitely have friends who've chosen career paths that are all about depth. You know, they are like deeply experts in a important area, be it, you know, sec the security infrastructure and computer science or whatever else, and they add a ton of value to the world. And like, that's a totally cool way to go. And some of them went to Brown. So I can see that happening as well. I do think the liberal, art edu liberal arts education does accommodate a way of thinking that you can apply in lots of different areas. I appreciate that um, clarification because I probably admit I, I've got my own bias because I think I can relate to your approach of uh, knowing lots of things and not necessarily being an expert per se. Uh, I, I think you're probably also not being completely honest about your own expertise. You clearly have depth in lots of areas and uh, it, it may not be something that occurs to all of us who feel like we're more generalists. but. Um, you were the CFO of Facebook, so you clearly had to have some depth. You wouldn't have risen to the, <laughs> you, you, you wouldn't have risen through the ranks at Genentech if you weren't recognized for having increasing amounts of depth. So maybe, maybe you earn that depth, you experience it over the course of a career. I'm not sure. Certainly, my depth is not zero. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but I would also say on any area I've worked in, someone knows more, a lot more than me because they've worked on it for many more years. Yeah, and it sounds like that's fine. Yeah, you, yeah. Right. I'll tell you what, why don't we see if there's any burning questions and we'll just see where this takes us. We've covered some of the landscape. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. Um, I just had a question specifically on like the whole depth versus breadth thing. So um, you were saying that having, like having, oh wait, the idea that people will always know like more than you is something that was always like seen in the different companies and, and initiatives that you went to. So at any point in um, like your journey of going to different companies and working there, did you ever like feel that like you wanted to learn more and you wanted to like also be as knowledgeable as the other people around you? And was there like any kind of disadvantage that you felt like not having that depth? Yeah. Uh, I think the answer is yes on every part of the question. So I think there have been mistakes that I made that I can look back on and say if I'd been deeper, uh, more knowledgeable about something, I might have, I might have uh, solved a problem differently and more and better. Um, so I think that uh, there are many moments where depth would have been helpful. Um, I also think sometimes it's just intimidating personally when you're trying to solve a problem and you like know that there's years of that this has existed for a long time and lots of people have worked on it in various ways and you're just, you've you know, read two articles and you're trying to figure it out. It's just hard. It makes you feel more insecure when you go home at night wondering if you did the right thing, if you're making the right decision than you would feel if you'd spent six years studying it and then you know, 10 years working on that, that problem. So it can be uncomfortable and you've got to be okay with that kind of ambiguity. The, um, the solution, of course, or the best solution I can think of, which I don't want to say makes up for these things, but you try to, to put in place, is to surround yourself with people who are deeper in the areas that matter than you are. So when it's worked well, I've found myself in the company of others who have had knowledge in the things where I'm weaker and been able to bring, no, 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 don't do that, and here's why, 
or this usually works, and let's just try this first before we move on to something else. Um, and that's not always been the case. So I've definitely had moments where I've really benefited from putting someone uh, or having someone on the team who's, who's deeper, um, and then sometimes I didn't, and then you just have to muddle through. But you really notice it. Um, I, I can, like, with great sharpness, think about moments in my career where I was facing a problem, and there was someone, let's say, new on the team, and you know, just didn't maybe not even know I, what I would get when I turned to them and I said, what would you do? And it was just like, oh, here's what I would do and why. And you're like, OK, you, you, you take the lead here. You know so much more about this. And that feels good that you have the depth in the problem, at least. Um, but then you really notice it when you don't have that and you're, you're, you're struggling. It's a great first question. Yes. Talk about how you moved from like Genetech to Facebook and from Facebook to Lara. And I'm just wondering if along the way there are also other opportunities and ideas that popped up but you let go. Mm -hmm. And why did you how do you make that evaluation of when to move on to a new thing? And what are your like I don't know, like criteria or how you evaluate that? Yeah. Lots of them. Uh, it's a great question too. Um, let me try and think of some fun ones. Um, so uh, I'll speak to one that, that I still think about sometimes. Um, when, when, uh, when I left Genentech, I actually, it's sort of similar to th telling you that I was going to be a history professor, I could have told you when I left what I was going to do next, and it was not go to Facebook. Um, I was really interested in the field of cancer diagnostics. You know, we have an interesting um, uh, opportunity and challenge in the field of cancer that historically we've diagnosed cancers based on the tissue of origin, so it's a prostate cancer or a breast cancer or whatever. But within 100 people with that condition, they have different looking tumors um, that have been stimulated by different genetic problems and, and whatnot. And the idea that we could get smarter at figuring out not just to tell you, well, you know, you have breast cancer and so we treat everyone with breast cancer with the same drug and about 20% of you respond and let's hope for the best. You know, can we get smarter at figuring out who the 20 are who are going to respond to this and then find some other classification for another 20 and treat them with something that's more tailored to their needs. I found that really interesting in the tools for diagnosing and treating cancer were evolving so rapidly that I thought there was, that, that the time might be ripe uh, for such uh, uh, a set of, of products and services to come forward. And that's what I imagined doing. Um, and I ended up not doing it, mainly because I was, got excited about the Facebook job and at the same time, I couldn't find like the right, maybe this gets to the last question too, I couldn't find the right team. You know, I was sort of searching for the person to start a company with, and I couldn't find who knew things I didn't know about the science, and I couldn't find the person. Um, and uh, so I look back on that sometimes. In general, I think it probably was the right thing because I do think that field has moved more slowly. This is a decade ago, and I think I would have guessed more progress in a decade if I was starting, if I had started a company, and I would have been disappointed. At the same time, there has been progress. You know, so we have added, the society has added value to that question, that diagnosis, that treatment, and it would have been fun to be a part of that. So, um, but I think in aggregate, I would have, if I'd started in 2009, a company in that area, I would have been making a bet in terms of more rapid progress than we've seen thus far. Um, so that would be an example. Um, there are others uh, along the way, but um, I think one of the nice things about or a good mindset about life is to not focus on the stuff that you didn't end up doing. Because there's some, I'm not the kind of person who believes there's one path. You know, I think everybody in this room can be happy and productive and contribute in multiple ways. So as long as you find one that you feel pretty good about, if you, if you find one that you don't feel good about, then most certainly change it. But if you find one you feel pretty good about, I wouldn't worry about the ones you didn't do because I think that's really the best you can ask for. So one of the biggest problems I can think of in mental health is um, there are certain communities that have a bias against mental health, Yeah. right? And so maybe people might not ask for help when they need it. And so how is Lyra combating that? Yeah, great question. And, and it is one of the, I would say, three core problems for us is getting people to ask for help and to, to seek to learn more if they're struggling. And we see in our data exactly what you are, I believe, alluding to, which is we do see differential levels of engagement depending upon uh, different, all sorts of demographic issues, age being, I think, the most impressive. And a good news item is that we are engaging younger people a lot more effectively than older people, so that may be a good sign for how society is evolving. We are having our most success with folks in the you know 24 to 39 sort of uh, age demographic. Um, so that's good. 
Um, what we try to do is to find language to talk about the issues that doesn't feel judgmental and stigmatizing. So um, we will occasionally speak to the clinical terms, like anxiety and depression are the clinical terms that you would use. Um, and that's fine, and we should do that. But we find that sometimes it's easier to get people to step up to think about stress as an example of a different word that isn't a clinical word, if you will. It doesn't have like a set of, you know, the same set of criteria around it, but it is often a word that will activate the same people and maybe get different people to step up. We talk about relationship issues a lot, which is again something that seems to uh, be more, be easier for some people to say, you know, yeah, I could use some help with that. And then that becomes the entry point to get them to talk about and think about other things that are going on in their lives. So, um, so I think that uh, that's a big part. The other thing is because the business strategy that we've taken to date focuses on providing services through employers. So we go to companies. We ask the companies to pay us for our services. And then we make our services available to their employees and family members. The, uh, a key ingredient for success is a company that is willing to talk about the issues in a way that doesn't feel like you're failing or you, are, you, you have failed or are failing if you need some help in these areas. So where we've worked with partners where someone in the leadership team is willing to step up and say, we're, we're doing this for a reason because we want you to get help if you need it. And it's, you know, it, it, that this kind of care can really help you to live a better life and be a better employee that, uh, that has worked better than companies that aren't willing to do that. So it's an it's a everyday battle and a big part of what we, we work on every day. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. Um, my question to you is about your time at Facebook. So you were the CFO of Facebook during their IPO, right? So I just wanted to ask, like, you weren't there for, for a super long time. How was it leading such a large company into such a momentous milestone? Yeah, uh, I, I really um, was fortunate for the, the experience that I had at Facebook. When I joined the company, it was, I, I don't remember exactly, but probably about 800 people. Uh, and by the time I left, it was certainly you know, uh, uh, more than 10,000, I don't remember the, that number either, but it was big. Um, and so just getting to see that kind of growth is really fun from a business standpoint, to see the kinds of challenges and opportunities that come as you scale. Um, but I think probably most important, it's a really special place in my mind. Um, I really enjoyed the people that I worked with. They're very super passionate about what they do, really trying to do the right thing when faced with what I view as very hard problems that don't have easy solutions and they don't always get what I would view as the credit they deserve um, for really trying to solve hard things as best they can. And I really enjoyed getting to, to watch that and, and, and hear about it. Um, the other thing that really inspired me about Facebook was um, it was the first place I'd worked where I got to see what it looks like when people believe that if you apply enough you know, good intent, software, and data, you can solve any problem in the world. Um, and it's not always true, right? There are, or it's not true easily. There are problems that actually take a long time and where we don't know how to solve them. But Facebook's not the kind of place that is daunted by hard problems, believing that we'll just need to put more people on, we'll need to work on it for longer, and we will ultimately you know, do something of value. And that, I don't think I would have had the courage to start Lyra and to imagine trying to use software and data to solve or to improve a very difficult area of the healthcare system if I hadn't been surrounded by that excitement and optimism that I got to see at Facebook every day. Um, and. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm thankful for that, and also just really thankful for the people that I got to meet and the, the, the sort of the, the friends I made. And um, it's a it's a really I think it's a really special company. And um, if you get a chance at some point in your journey to work at a place that's like right on the cusp of something that's clearly really important, it brings an energy and a, it's like a magnet for conversation to it that's really fun to be in the middle of. I don't think I contributed much to it in the sense of like I didn't have any particularly brilliant ideas about, or even good ideas necessarily, about how to solve some of the problems it was facing in terms of, or it is now facing, some of the challenges that it was working on in terms of how you, you, know, you become a platform for communication and then you live with the consequences of what people communicate on it. Um, but that doesn't mean it wasn't fun to listen to people try to figure out, you know, or to, to think about those problems and try to figure them out. I just wanted to ask, you know, you say you really liked your work, you really kind of kept that entrepreneurial spirit uh, really seems since you left Brown, and you talked a little bit about how you know you know idea is good uh, when you really want to work on it. But I was just curious, you know, how your 
uh, maybe environment has played into that. It seems like, you know, a few of the companies you worked at may not have been typically like an entrepreneurial company, something maybe like, you know, working at uh, Wall Street. I don't know if that was like what you would think of an entrepreneurial uh, company. So kind of how you kind of kept with that spirit and really interested in your work, uh, even if the environment may or may not have uh, helped that. Yeah, one of the nice things I think about, uh, you know, what happens over the course of one's career as you move around a bit is you get to work in different environments and you get to see the differences and you get to start to be smarter about what you like and don't like and what kind of environment you feel like you can thrive in. And um, I do think part, another thing that Brown was a starting point for me that I didn't say earlier in answering your question is I think that so much of life is a journey in learning about yourself and learning about not just what kind of problems you like, but what kind of environments you're comfortable in and you can thrive in. Um, and I don't think there's a right answer for everybody. Like, we're different. It's what makes the world fun, is we have you know, differences of opinion and style and other sorts of things about um, where, we, where we'll do our best work. Um, and so each of the places I've worked has had a different environment. And, um, and, and every one of them had some good things and some bad things. Um, so at each place, had good things and bad things for me. At each place, I've gotten to see a little bit of, you know, I really like this project or this conversation or whatever. I feel really comfortable in it. I feel really excited by it. But in every job I've ever had, there's also been like, I don't love this conversation. It doesn't make me feel really good. Um, I, I don't feel, I don't want to be a part of it. If I could avoid it, I would. Um, and, uh, and as you learn about that, you can try and bias the next environment for more of the stuff you like and less of the stuff that you don't. So um, I'll riff on this just for a second longer, and then I'm happy to be more specific if people find it interesting. There's very different kinds of problems at every company. There's problems that raise, range from uh, one example would be like from the more tangible. Like it's clearly solvable. It's just a question of how are we going to solve it. Like we need to staff a phone line 24-7 to answer these kinds of calls. This is doable. The world has done it before. But there's a lot of questions. How are we going to do it and where? And, you know, and how, how are we going to staff it? And what technology will we use? But it's like tangible, clear problems. And then there's problems that are much more abstract. And you don't even know if they're solvable at all, um, where you're trying to like, invent something that the world has never seen before. Um, and I think people are drawn to different kinds of problems over that kind of continuum. And I would say that uh, whatever jobs you guys end up working in, you'll discover that you find yourself in both kinds of conversations and learning a little bit about yourself, which kinds of problems you like. You know, which meeting do you wish ran longer and which one are you checking your watch and hoping to leave? And then you can try and bias the next environment or the next job or whatever so that you spend more of your time on the kinds of problems that appeal to you. So I think that there's no right and wrong in the environments I've been in, but they're different. Um, and just learning about yourself and where you feel most excited to spend eight, 10, however many hours each day is part of what each job should be about for you. So that as you become not 20, but 30 and ultimately 40 and, and beyond, you're spending more and more of your time in a fashion you're excited about. It's hard to do that in your first job out of college. One, because you won't have an infinite choice. And two, because honestly, I think you are very special if you know yourself well enough at this age to really know where you'll thrive. I did not. So it took me time to sort that out. Um, but you can try to guess at it a little bit. And certainly, uh, I wouldn't discourage that. I just don't set the expectation that like, if you don't get it right in your first job, you're behind the eight ball. You're not. It's a journey, and it takes time. Hi. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I have two questions I want to ask. So the first is, uh, what point uh, did you decide to do work on Lyra full time? And the second one is, you know, you talked about half of work is getting along with people. So if you could talk more about that and, like, if maybe your leadership style has changed over time or for your different roles. Yeah. So uh, the, the first question on Lyra, um, it, it wasn't one of those things where I wasn't thinking about it and then one moment I was all in. It was, you know, like a bit of a... I started thinking about it. I started thinking about it more. And I started talking to people. I would be scheduling time every week to meet with someone who was doing something in the field to get their opinion, ask them questions, and sort of get more and more excited. And then I do remember the moment I would point to. It's just hard to describe why it was the moment. But I was at a uh, coffee shop in, in uh, Burlingame, which is the town next to where I live, with um, two other uh, people who I was talking to about this. And they basically just put on the table, let's stop talking. Let's just do this. Like, let's make this moment the founding of this company. Um, and I looked back at them, and I was yeah. 
with, I, I agree, let's do it. And so we shook hands and Lyra was born, if you will. It had a different name, the first of many. Uh, so I should, when I say Lyra was born, it was born with a different name. But, uh, um, but that was when I decided I'm gonna do this. I'm excited, I know enough, I'm ready. Um, and their enthusiasm was helpful. I, I ha am super fortunate to have co-founders who I think are terrific and have you know, sustained me through difficult moments. Um, so without them, I don't know if I would have gotten there by that moment, but I was lucky to have them. Um, and then your second question was, say it again, I'm sorry. Yeah, getting along with people, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot. Um, so uh, that, that also has been a bit of a journey for me. So uh, I'll tell you a story that I think sort of is, is a springboard for me. So in my early years at Genentech, um, I was working on a deal that I was very excited about. We were, we were uh, uh, trying to license from another company a drug to treat uh, a cancer called non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and I was really excited that it, would be, it could be an important product. So I just, my, I thought my job was like, get this deal done. And like, if people put up roadblocks, like, you know, roll, you know, roll over them. Um, and uh, we ended up getting the deal done, and at one point, I don't remember like the exact timing, but uh, the CEO, of, I was pretty junior at that point, but the CEO of the company called me and asked me to come down to his office, and that had never happened before, and wasn't like I was expecting to ever hear from him. We were a pretty big company, and I was not, you know, close to him. I mean, I figured, well, we got this deal done, he's gonna wanna say thank you. Like, I was, I was in a good mood walking down the hill to his office. Um, but it turned out that what he wanted to talk to me about was to give me some feedback that he was concerned by that in trying to get the deal done, I had not treated some of the colleagues who were involved uh, in the way that they had wanted to be treated. That they had an opinion about things and I had, rather than listening and collaborating and working through it, it just kind of rolled over their opinion and that they really were not, like that this was a problem. That they were not excited to work with me on the next thing and that the impact I was going to make in my career would be limited if I couldn't build you know, really good relationships with people when I disagreed with them. Because building good relationships when you agree is actually pretty, I shouldn't say easy, but easier at any rate. Um, the hard part is doing it when you actually have a substantive and, and well-intentioned disagreement. Um, and it was a real eye-opener and wake-up call for me that like, wait a sec, this is important to this person I respect so much too, and that I need to work on it. And, um, and I started, and it's been, and I still am. I mean, it's not one of those things where like, awareness is a good start. So that, mo that meeting was like a moment of awareness for me, but awareness doesn't help you to know what to say and not say when you find yourself in those moments necessarily. It just causes you to work on it. Um, and so I've been doing that since, and I've had worked, uh, it's the kind of thing you can work on every day, and it's the kind of thing you can work on uh, by reading, you know, because people write a lot of books on like how you have difficult conversations, how you disagree, how you collaborate. It's the kind of thing you can work on by, if you're lucky enough to work at a place that will support you in doing this, doing training. You know, so at various points in my career, I've been able to go off-site for a day or a week and do uh, various kinds of training and how to be a better and more effective leader. Um, and you learn new skills and you practice them um, so that you can apply them in the situations you find yourself in. And so uh, the reason I think this is so important is um, something I think all of you will see, and I, I encourage you to like be on the lookout for because it's kind of both fun to observe and you can learn from it, is a really talented group of people can accomplish next to nothing if there isn't trust and there isn't sort of a spirit of collaboration. You can put six really, I made up six because I like six person team sizes, not that that's important, but um, I just find with more people than that, it's like it gets harder to get work done. But you can put like the right number of people with the right skills in a room and like a year later not be very far along. Um, and you can put a less talented group of people in a room, even possibly less dedicated group of people in a room and do a lot more if they trust each other and they support each other and everybody's strengths are leveraged rather than everybody being constantly trying to like point out and deal with the weaknesses that they see. So I just think collaboration is this hidden asset in an organization that has such a big impact on, on what an organization is able to accomplish or not accomplish. Um, so, uh, so you have to work on it. Actually, I got a question a, a moment ago about Facebook. It's one of the, I think, things that made Facebook such an important and successful uh, product in the world. I've never worked anywhere that has a stronger spirit of collaboration than that organization has. People just approach problems as if we have to solve this together. I can't solve it on my own. And I'm gonna trust that the person who's coming into the room to solve it with me is like both skilled and well-intentioned. And that if we work together, we can figure out a way to bring our respective strengths to the table. That's just like built into the DNA of that company. So um, I'm trying to think if I have anything else. I can't at the time think of anything else to say, but, but a very important thing. If you have more questions about it, please ask them and I'll, I'll find something Maybe else. Maybe an appropriate point to pause. We'll, we'll continue to take questions, but I recognize just from the room that some of you may need to leave. 
Um, let's just take a minute, even while you're still here, and thank David for being with us. I will thank him again at the real end, but uh, if you have to leave, um, by all means, feel free. We'll just take a second. I don't want to encourage you to leave, but, uh, and then if you're staying, just move up so we could see you and hear from you a little bit more. Were there other questions? Yes. Oh, hi. <laughs> The closer everybody gets, the more likely I'll sit, because then I can still yeah, see everything. Get closer, we'll sit. <laughs> Hi, uh, Hi, thank you so much. This has been really great. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how you and Lyra plan to like navigate that tricky relationship between like a company's, especially like a, a Silicon Valley startups, like relationship between its social and commercial goals. Yeah. Like, especially now, like there's maybe some growing disillusionment between like. The, Silicon Valley stated goals like yeah. of trying to you know solve problems that are real in the world, but also actually maybe profiting off of them. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I will stand up. But I, I love this question because I think it's a really important one and a really hard one. Um, every company I've ever worked at has struggled with the sort of statement of mission and then the desire and need for profits to sustain the business and how you find that balance. It's just hard and there's no easy answer and. Um, and you have to, I think you have to approach it with a starting point of you're gonna have trouble managing these things in the short run. I don't believe they're necessarily in conflict in the long run, and I'll get to that in a sec, but in the short run, you're gonna have decisions to make that will optimize for one or the other, and you're gonna have to know who you are and just try to do those. So uh, let me speak to each company I worked at, if you don't mind, because I think there's very different ones. I think one of the things I really didn't like about my journey on Wall Street was how disconnected those things were. Um, we really would sort of pretend that we cared about our clients' interests, but like that was not what drove that business. It was really, uh, there was a lot of make-believe in terms of uh, the products we were building and who they were actually good for. Or and maybe products isn't the right word, but the, the way we were approaching transactions. You got paid for transactions, you were motivated to think every transaction was a good transaction, and that I just, it, it wore on me after a while. Uh, so that was my Wall Street experience. I didn't love that. Uh, at Genentech, you had the issue of drug pricing. So like, you know, we made drugs for people who were sick. So, uh, and um, you could certainly make an argument that it's easier to get them in everybody's hands if you price them lower. Um, but if you want to make the kind of profits that you can funnel back into R&D so you can try and invent the next thing for the next patient, you want to price them higher. And it's a conflict. And it's a conflict that was there maybe not every day, but it would bubble up from time to time and be hard. You know, and it wasn't one of those things where anybody could say, no, we're doing this perfectly. Um, but you're trying to manage two conflicting objectives that are, uh, I don't, again, I don't want to say like perfectly in conflict, but have their moments of conflict. Um, Facebook, I, I think some of the stuff that is manifest is, is more obvious, but, or, or more topical today. But the one when I was there was much more just about like, you know, what role ads played in a communication tool. And that, you know, the more ads Facebook showed, the more money Facebook made. But it didn't, you know, there, that the mission was to connect the world. And ads can, you know, occasionally you see a good ad that represents something you really want. But sometimes you might not. And how you find that balance. And the company worked to find the right balance where it could make enough money to invest in being a great company and developing new tools and still have a great user experience. Um, and at Lyra. So luckily, I, I think that one of the things I like is to try and find a business where the conflicts are, those two, that particular conflict isn't too disruptive. And I think we've found one thus far at Lyra for the following reason. Um, I think by working with companies, we have a reasonable alignment of interest if we can find companies who fundamentally believe that they have a bunch of people walking around the office who are suffering um, from like really debilitating conditions like you know, substance abuse being a, a, a strong one, but anxiety and depression as well. And they're not getting the most productivity from those people. Like those people walking around feeling that way means they're probably not bringing everything that they have to contribute in their jobs. So if we find companies like that, they're motivated to say, we want to find those people. We want you to find those people. You know, they have to not be involved, of course. But we want you to get them good care and get them better. Um, and then the company's motivated to do it. That's what our mission is. It all kind of jives and aligns. And um, for us, uh, the manifestation of that that we have not figured out yet, but it's at least something we aspire to and we're young enough in our journey that we could still imagine it happening, is the kinds of business models where, for example, we would get paid based on the number of people we help. So a lot of healthcare models historically have been fee for service. So you get paid based on the amount of service you provide. So you are motivated to do as many of the procedures or transactions or visits or whatever as you can fit into a day because that's how you maximize your bottom line. And you will then, even a well-intentioned person, and most people in healthcare are well-intentioned or they would have chosen to do something else, but even a well-intentioned person can find that motivation in the gray area 
to be like, yeah, well, this person does need that, and it's probably the right thing. You know, you, 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 you create the opportunity for bias in a certain direction. If we have, a, and historically the mental health models have been all fee-for-service, so it's all about just how do I do more sessions, you know, and, and that's how I get paid more. If you could flip the economic model, so it's about symptom improvement is what drives financial returns, and it's how much better do people get, you at least have more vectors pointing in the same direction. And I think these things are possible. I don't think they're easy. I don't think we'll get there next year. Um, but I think these th things are both possible and exciting. And I would love to run a business that minimizes the conflict between its mission and its financial returns. Shut up, um, I've read a lot about VR being used in healthcare. Um, and I'm curious for your thoughts on like VR's kind of influence in the mental health space and also if you kind of like see that as a potential mode um, yeah. with VR. Yeah, I'm, so I'm not an expert in VR and healthcare, but I know enough to at least try to answer your question a little bit. Um, I think that uh, all tools and technologies will find their way to healthcare if they want to start there, right? Like it's just not the place. You start with something like games where you can do something and it's easier and not if you do it badly, someone just doesn't enjoy their game, hopefully, and doesn't you know, hurt themselves. So healthcare trails on all of these new platforms, as it probably should. So VR will first disrupt other things, I think, at my prediction, and then make its way to healthcare. But you could certainly imagine the opportunity to take people who are experts in something and make it easier for them to help patients who are not right next to them um, by using technology. And VR would be a powerful way to help someone who is like the world expert in some very rare and nuanced, let's say, surgery to be able to perform that surgery successfully on someone who they may not be in the same room as, and that's really exciting. And, and there's other opportunities to use VR like that. Uh, in mental health, I, I think there are opportunities for VR, but I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say it's at the core of what we do or, or how we're thinking. Um, there are certain conditions in mental health where one of the evidence-based treatments involves exposure. So putting people in conditions that they might be scared of, but in a controlled manner and really sort of slowly ramping up um, their comfort level being exposed to be it flying or whatever else. And VR seems like a very powerful way to be able to put someone in a more realistic set of those conditions in a controlled environment where you can really see how they're doing, stop if they're not doing well, you know, escalate or, or expand if they are doing well, et cetera. So that feels like an example of a, a treatment modality that is very amenable to what VR has to offer. And those things are being developed today, not by Lyra, but by others, and I'm excited to see those come forward. You mentioned that like a lot of your career seems like serendipitous, but why do you think Facebook gave you that offer? Um, so uh, I think that um, it's it's hard for me to say because they did it, but but I, I think based on what I know of the conversation, um, two things that I think appealed to them. Um, so one was. Uh, at the time um, that Facebook was a smaller company but aspired to be a bigger one, the uh, folks who were running the company were really very attuned to the idea of trying to build a great culture in a place that they wanted to build a 100-year company, you know, a company that would make an impact, positive impact on the world for a really long time. And they felt, and I agree with this, that the way to do that is to attract a great workforce, put them in an environment where they can be really productive, and that culture is an important part of that. So I think they were very interested in what other companies had built great cultures and what could they learn from other companies to try and help them to do that. And Genentech, uh, fortunately, had a reputation that I, I think was well-deserved as being one of the great places to work. It had, if you see Fortune does this survey every year, and, and, and Genentech had been ranked first on it before Google sort of took over that spot um, uh, as the best place in the country to work. Um, so I think it had a reputation that made companies like Facebook ear or two, you know, who can we get who's been involved at Genentech and could help us think about how Genentech has approached the challenge of building a great culture. So I think that was... Um, uh, part of it was that I had a I had an experience set that was interesting to them, um, and also I think they were taken with uh, the, you know I said my background was a little non traditional I hadn't worked in finance until I became the CFO at Genetech so I'd worked in other areas, um, and I think they thought that was interesting that someone to sit in that chair who wouldn't just be kind of the stereotypical finance person but might be able to contribute to other sorts of issues and problems I think felt like more interesting than someone who was going to be so narrow uh, that they might not really contribute as much. So um, those were some of the things they talked to me about. So I realize I'm kind of setting up a false dichotomy, but um, in Lyra, how do you kind of differentiate between what is a business challenge and what's more of like a clinical challenge? 
And um, how do you decide which ones are feasible to kind of tackle yeah. is the first part. And the second part is you alluded to data earlier. So what are some ways in which you're using data to um, improve and refine uh, the product that you're offering? I don't, I don't think it's a false dichotomy. I think it's an important question and it's a real question. Um, so we're trying to run a business and we're trying to care for people. So uh, I'll, I'll give you the sort of administrative answer first, but I think it frames the question. So we actually have two entities at Lyra. There's a business entity whose job is to like develop technology and, and relationships with other, com other companies. And then we have a clinical, clinical entity that I don't run um, that's run by someone who has taken the Hippocratic Oath and is uh, um, you know, uh, committed to making sure that their decisions are guided by what's in the best interest of patients. And when those decisions on a one-off basis come up, I, don't, I get told later off sometimes, sometimes I don't, and that's fine. I think it's appropriate because I don't have the expertise to weigh in, and I think symbolically, um, me not being involved shows, you know, just shows everyone who is involved in those decisions that they should be using their clinical judgment. So it doesn't mean I'm not involved in longer term questions around like, hey, what should we build and who do we want to be? But if there's an individual patient and what do we do with this person involved, there's really no reason I should be in the room for that. Um, so creating some separation and then just trying to do the right thing by everybody. We, we do not often, but occasionally get an interesting pickles where like the company doesn't want to pay for something that we think would be the right care or uh, you know, issues like that and you just work through them as best you can on a one-off basis. And they're hard uh, and they create both conflict and pain um, regardless of what, you know, what, what decision you make. Some, there's pain in one direction or another. Um, so that's very real. Uh, and then you're, I, I keep forgetting the second half of the question. So the second part was around um, what types of data you use uh, yes, to guide okay. your decision making? Yeah, so I'll give you an example of, um, of that because I think that's pretty interesting and exciting. So one of the things that I think is often dysfunctional about healthcare in general is that we're not measuring the quality of the care we provide. So it's very hard to make something better if you don't know how it is today. So um, I was very inspired when I thought about starting Lyra by something I'd read um, that I, the article I read was about the state of New York, but I think there's other states that have done this. Um, they're big uh, purchasers of certain kinds of healthcare because they oversee the Medicaid program. So um, they insisted that all hospitals that wanted any of that business would have to publish the rates of mortality um, for bypass surgery, cabbage surgery, so it's surgery for someone who's got a blocked artery to their heart. Uh, and the hospitals were like up in arms, no way, we're different, you know, we get the most complicated patients, we shouldn't have to do this, and the state just insisted, too bad. We'll risk adjust, we'll do it, you know, engage, we'll have a conversation with you about how to make it fair, but we want to see this. And when the data was published, it turned out that there was pretty big differences from hospital to hospital that nobody knew going in. And there were hospitals that were better and others that weren't very good. And that sort of transparency, that light, motivated the hospitals that weren't very good to either get out of the business and say, you know what, we're going to stop doing bypass, we'll do other things really well. Or to say, let's figure out what we're not doing well by learning from these other hospitals and let's get to their rate. Let's get to 1% mortality and away from 5%. And there's a wonderful story of how knowledge uh, and transparency can lead to improvement and better outcomes. In mental health, generally, people are treated for conditions and there is no measurement of whether or not they improved, which leaves you, when you if, if it's your turn to get care, without a source of knowledge about like, okay, there's 100 providers in my community, which one should I see? You know, maybe you can find someone who's seen one of them before and you can ask them, but word of mouth is not a very scalable approach in general. It's a particularly bad approach in mental health because you don't know which ones of your friends, generally, have gotten care and they may not want to talk about it. So, and they may not even know what good, you know, whether they got good care or not because it's, a, it's very, it's, it doesn't have to be very subjective, but sometimes it is. So, one of the things that we were committed to doing at Lyra, which is hard, but we work on every day, is there are these tools that are given to people at the beginning of treatment and at the end of treatment. They're self-reported questionnaires about symptoms in these areas, and you can assess whether or not someone's symptoms have improved over time. And these kinds of questionnaires are used, for example, to approve drugs to treat things like depression. So there are validated questionnaires that are the best we have to go on because we can't read your mind, we can't, like, we have to just ask you, you know, how are you feeling? But if you ask at the beginning and you ask along the way and you ask at the end, you can find trends. So with all of the clients where we pay for care, we are seeking to get those kinds of outcomes at the beginning, the middle, and the end. And that information can help us to understand our providers better, uh, the therapists in our network, for example, and who's good at what. So we can use that data to assess that, well, we have a provider in the San Francisco area who seems to be really excellent at treating uh, clients with anxiety. The next person who comes to Lara with anxiety, we should send to that person. Um, we may have other clients that are struggling to deliver those kinds of outcomes, but maybe are really good at some other condition. 
and we should send the right kind of client to them. And of course, when I say this, we're not all doing this manually. We're teaching the machines to learn how to assess those signals and then to change the algorithms so that we're matching people immediately to the kind of provider who has demonstrated success for people with the kinds of symptoms that that person has. So that is, it's, a, it's like one of the things I like about it is it's simple, or I hope it feels simple to all of you. I hope you're all sitting there like, duh, why wouldn't you do that? And yet, to my knowledge, we are the only company in the mental health system doing that. So it just speaks to how far behind healthcare often is on what are seemingly simple kinds of technology and data interventions. Let's take one more question. Can you pass the mic back? And then we can, if you have the uh, interest, we'll see if we can do things really informally. But let's make this the last more formal question. That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think it's just a little bit going off of that. I'm just wondering, you talked a little bit about like the supply issue within mental health and maybe people not being seen for 30 days out. And I've heard a lot about this shortage of uh, the correct talent. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how you guys said, okay, we're going to solve that problem and how, what have the biggest issues been along the way of, okay, you want to have immediate care or, and what you've done to be able to bring that instead of uh, other people on the way. Yeah, let me talk about the access part because it's, I think, the easiest to conceptualize. Again, when I describe my solution, you, you will, I hope, be like, duh, and yet again, I think we're the only company doing this. So if you were to seek mental health today in the Providence area, I would submit that it is likely that there is some provider who is able to see you in the next week. But your challenge, if you need to find them, is that any place you would go to search for providers will give you hundreds of them, and you have a needle in the haystack problem. Someone on that list will see you. You don't know which one. Um, so you can call, I, I know what a lot of people do because they don't understand the problem, they just call one. They wait a week to get called back and told that they won't see you and you're like, okay, I wasted a week and I'm nowhere and then you call two and you know, ultimately you call 10 at a time until, you know, with the hope that someone will call you back. Um, so it's really frustrating to find that capacity that is available. Um, what we've done with our providers as best we can, I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit just to make the problem sound easier because uh, I don't mean to mislead so much as to excite you about the possibility, is to try and get all of our providers to connect their calendars with us so we can see who has openings in the next couple of weeks. And if you do a search through Lear, we're not going to send, we're not going to surface for you 100 providers and say good luck. We're going to surface for you 10 providers but all 10 of those should have some availability in the next couple weeks, with the idea being that your schedule is hard too. So we can't, you know, we don't know when you're free necessarily. So we need to give you enough choice of people who have some availability that if one person is only available next Thursday and you're traveling, you need to look at the second one. And ideally, you can look at all those calendars online. So you don't have to call 10 people, you just sort of flip through the calendars and you're like, that one has a spot that's convenient for me. And you, two minutes into your search, have an appointment, as opposed to two months in, or whatever else, having, engaged, having invested so much time that you're feeling exhausted by the process, this should be quick and easy and light. So again, it's a data problem. It's a different data problem than the one I described, is can we assemble information about availability that emerge, that surfaces the needles and doesn't show you the rest of the haystack? I'd say that's a good place to end, at least the formal part. If entrepreneurship, the way we think about it, is a structured process for problem solving, that's a really good example of one. And maybe it is, duh, to you know, lots of folks who live with Google calendars since they were born. But uh, for those who are a little bit older, it seems like a, a pretty nice breakthrough. We still uh, have about half our price, and this is why we haven't solved the problem as extensively as we'd like, though we're very proud of what we built, don't get me wrong. But we do have about, I don't remember the number, but uh, maybe it's a quarter of our providers do do pen and pencil calendar. And it's very hard to integrate electronically with a pen and pencil calendar. We have not figured out how to do that. So we have a different strategy for them that works less well. But at least most of our providers use either Google Calendar or some other system like it that we can read, that if they let us, of course, we can't read it for starters, but if they're willing to let us integrate, we can read that. So before we thank David um, for a final time, I want to sneak in two quick plugs. One again is for the uh, event with Slater next Thursday, the 25th. It's the Sushi Networking event where we're going to be announcing the Brown Venture Founders Awards. The other is, some of you may have heard the rumor that we are moving into a new space for the Nelson Center. I know all of you describe it as the Shake Shack building. Um, <laughs> our mission is to have that be flipped and have you describe it as the Nelson Center's building with the Shake Shack on the first floor. Uh, we will be moving in in two weeks. And in the first week of May, uh, May 6th and scattered around those times, uh, we'll be having study breaks in preparation for exams in that new building. And so we will feed you, we will show you our new digs, and we want to welcome you to um, those events. 
All of our events like this one are available on our, on our entrepreneurship.brown.edu website. And if for some reason you are not signed up for our email updates, please go there and sign up. Now let's thank David again. Thanks so much for being here.